California Channel Islands are a series of eight islands off the coast of Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. These islands have really unique flora and fauna, including the island fox. The story of the California island fox is a story of recovering endangered species, but also an entire ecosystem. Here we are in the Channel Islands, so close to LA, yet a completely different world. It is. It's a very special ecosystem, and there are very unusual animals here. How does archaeology help you conserve an area like this? Well, archaeology really allows us to look back in time and see what the environment looked like 100 years ago when there was historic ranching on the island, or 1,000 years ago when there were large Native American villages on the island. If you look here, you see an archaeological midden, which is a, a deposit of their waste that they left behind. Island foxes have been recovered from over 50 different sites. So what kind of uh, things do they find in the middens? So from middens, we have shellfish, bones like these, um, that we can extract DNA from and learn about the past uh, environment as well as what genetic diversity might have looked like in the past. What's the oldest island fox that you found? So the oldest island fox um, has been radiocarbon dated to about 7,300 um, years old. Here we actually have the second oldest island fox specimen that is about 7,000 years ago. We've sampled this for radiocarbon dating, but also uh, genetic analysis and isotopic analysis. How does the process work? We take a small sample, like you see here, a small little notch from a bone, and we can extract DNA, we can run isotopes, we can look at trace element analysis, all sorts of different methodologies. I measured the skulls so that I could compare the island fox in the archaeological record against the present day samples with morphology. Fast forward 35 years and we have new technology now. Uh, Courtney's gone back and she's using new technology to visit some of those same specimens that I pull out of bags and identified from sites. It's caused us to completely rethink uh, our collections and the value of the collections and how we assemble our collections. We know that island foxes probably diverged uh, from their mainland relative from between 9,000 and 7,000 years ago, which is really interesting. And it supports what Paul had found earlier with his morphological data that suggested the Northern California, Oregon foxes are more morphologically similar to island foxes. But regardless of how they got to the Northern Islands originally, the fact was that they were probably moved by ancient peoples from the Northern Island group to the Southern Island group. You can find island fox bone, pieces or parts of island fox that have been recovered out of human burials. And then you can find ceremonial burials of whole island fox carcasses. All of those speak to the fact that Native Americans were looking at island foxes in a very different way. Uh, they, they obviously revered them uh, and they were important to the Native American community. How does the fox's diet change during the year? By looking at the scat, I found that island foxes fed very intensively in the late fall and early winter on deer mice. And then during the winter, we had a real increase in the amount of beetles that they were eating. And then by the summer and fall, uh, they transitioned into uh, feeding really intensively on grasshoppers. Now we can do scat analysis with metagenomics. We can just sequence and, and identify what foxes were eating seasonally. A much cleaner and easier way to do a study on diet um, than I did. What was the impact of ranches on uh, population sizes of these foxes? Grazing activity had a dramatic effect on the terrestrial habitats. Other animals like cats and dogs may have been vectors for introducing disease into the island fox populations, resulting in dramatic declines in, in populations of the island fox. Just how small was the population at that stage? An island like San Miguel Island, which went from about 450 foxes down to uh, less, than, uh, less than 15 animals. Mm -hmm. 
Bald eagles were a dominant apex avian predator on all of the Channel Islands. They fed on primarily marine resources. DDT is introduced into the environment, it gets into the food chains and causes eggshell thinning. Bald eagle populations disappeared by the early 1960s from every single island. That niche opened up and golden eagles find the islands. Lo and behold, they have these big things that look like jackrabbits and they, they started to hammer them. What's the first step to, to turn things around? It required the removal of the introduced grazing animals from the islands. You had to get them off because they were sustaining golden eagles. And you had to reintroduce that apex avian predator, the bald eagle, back onto the Channel Islands to fill that niche. Fast forward 12 years from start to finish, the island fox was taken off the endangered species list in 2016. What was the effect of restoring the island foxes? We're seeing an increase in the available fresh water in streams and seeps occurring in areas where they've never been recorded before because the vegetation is now capturing fog throughout the year and you're having less runoff and less erosion. Those changes in habitat have led to this uh, growth in populations of, of, of other endemic species. So the island gopher snake would be a good example. Island scrub jays, um, their habitat is slowly recovering. If you want to recover the species, you have to recover the system that it lives in uh, to make itself sustainable over the long term. And so by recovering the system, uh, you allow the sustainability of this species. It's an amazing story because this little charismatic guy here is changing the whole ecosystem, right? Restoring uh, and working to protect this species is really transforming an entire um, community. I was surprised to learn how beneficial the impact of island foxes is on the whole ecosystem. And how genomics can be used to ensure the future health of the population. 